I guess it's, uh, it's noon time now, so it's officially good afternoon. Um, my name is Vin Nguyen, one of the faculty here at uh, LSU and one part of the section of general internal medicine. I'm a, I guess I define myself as a hospitalist, but I still do a little clinic here and there. But my talk today is about uh, high value care. Let's see here. I have no disclosures. My objectives for uh, this uh, talk will be to define high value in healthcare, identify some obstacles to high value care, and to discuss some steps towards uh, high value care. Anybody know who this man is? No, unless you're, uh, I guess, uh, part of the hospitalist movement and all. This is uh, Dr. Robert Walter. He's um, the chair of medicine at uh, UCSF in uh, San Francisco. And he famously coined the term hospitalist in the, uh, in the early 90s in an NEJM uh, article. Oh, I was, while I was um, researching this topic, I came across a little foreword in the book. In the setting, he was in a small seminar, and uh, he was running through a variety of topics with some students about some health-related policy. Student asked him to about the changes he's seen in healthcare over the past 30 years or so that he's been in clinical practice, and where he saw healthcare was headed during their professional lifetimes. So what he said was, "You folks need to be prepared for a career that will be massively different from mine. You will be under relentless pressure to deliver the highest quality, safest, most satisfying care at the lowest possible cost." So. After a brief pause, one of the students uh, raised their hands and asked them, so what exactly were you trying to do? <laughs> so for most part, I mean, when we think about the healthcare system these days, I mean, uh, clinicians and administrators, overwhelmed by all the pressures that they find now they, to develop, deliver high value care. The more stringent regulations and accreditation requirements, more public reporting and w about various value-related measures, value-based purchasing, that's a little buzzword these days, initiatives, new payment models such as bundling and uh, accountable care organ organizations, even Yelp reviews, that, and apps that offer cost and quality data in just a single click. So that's a lot to take in at one time. Yet it is odd that, not that we are now under pressure, but what is odd is that until recently we were not. So the indictment against our healthcare system, particularly the American system, though other countries face the same thing, is well known. Evidence accumulated over the last generation finds that we do poorly in virtually every measure of healthcare value. Variations in care are enormous, medical errors are rampant, and tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands, oh, I'm sorry, of people die each year from preventable harm. People frequently are, are unhappy with their care, and access is sporadic and unpredictable. And if that weren't bad enough, the cost of health care is skyrocketing. I mean, government, corporations, and uh, individuals are going bankrupt because of health care. So the field of patient safety has taught us most errors are committed by good, competent people working in dysfunctional systems. And so it is with the uh, health care value. Well, there are certainly instances of low value care being delivered by clinicians who are incompetent or even dishonorable, most low-value care is delivered by clinicians working in just dysfunctional systems. So it's not just the healthcare delivery system itself, the clinics and hospitals, but also the system of training young physicians and other clinicians, system that capturing data and making it available to both the clinician and patients at the point of care, and also the system that regulate medicine, the malpractice system, and of course, the payment system. So in light of all the various complexity, efforts to improve value need to be broad-based, innovative, and interdisciplinary. I'll start here with a little case. So you, it's a typical case that you may see in your clinic. And you know, it's a Ms. Jones, an 82-year-old woman with CHF, AFib, osteoporosis, OA, CKD, multiple medical problems. She sees multiple physicians, a PCP, cardiologist, pulmonologist, and nephrologist. She's on multiple medications, 12 of them, which she takes, some of them takes twice daily. She's 
She's on a fixed income and has to pay a few hundred dollars out of pocket each month for her medications. But unbeknownst to her, some of her brand name prescriptions have effective, cheaper generic uh, alternatives available. She scheduled to get an echo that was ordered by her pulmonologist to assess the worsening shortness of breath. They placed the ultrasound probe on the chest and start echo, and then she realized that she had this exact same test just a few weeks ago when her cardiologist called, uh, ordered it for her to check on her CHF. So it occurs to her that she's never told the results of the test. Her multiple physicians use different electronic medical records. In fact, her pulmonologist still uses paper charts and they never seem to know what test the other has ordered. One time she asked her nephrologist why she needed to have blood work done when she just had blood drawn a week ago with her PCP. And she was told that it's just better to have it done here again so it's in our system. So we've all seen this, and the case highlights that the, the fact that healthcare in the United States is complex, it's fragmented, it's inefficient, and with unexplained variation and waste. So in order to navigate this complexity in ways that make care more affordable, safe, and convenient, patients and their caregivers need to understand how to deliver and receive high-value care. This requires understanding in the origins and the roots of what of the causes of our health system shortfalls, being able to recognize existing sources of, and types of waste, and learning new methods of delivering care. So, the Institute of Medicine put out a report in 2013. We've made some interesting comparisons with our healthcare system in everyday life. So one of the things was, if banking was like healthcare, ATM transactions would take not seconds, but perhaps days or longer as a result of unavailable or misplaced records. If home building was like healthcare, carpenters, electricians, and plumbers, each would work with different blueprints with very, different, very little coordination. My favorite one is this one. If shopping was like healthcare, product prices would not be posted, and the price charge would vary widely within the same store depending on the source of payment. So what does this, why does all of this matter? So as healthcare providers, we are here to help patients, right? Improving life and dignity of, of death and is the central purpose of healthcare. As we remember from med school, the four central pillars of ethics is first, do no harm, our patients, beneficence, do good for patients, patient autonomy, and justice. So no matter how, how hard each of us tries to do a good job with the patient that's sitting in front of us, if we do not focus on the results we achieve with our patients, we we'll often fail at this responsibility. So my objective is here, so how do we define value? It all goes back to that value equation, so quality, Value equals quality divided by cost. So we want to maximize the quality divided by cost equation. In other words, producing the best health outcomes at the lowest cost. As that 2013 uh, Institute of Medicine report defines value, it says that it's the best care for the patient with the optimal result for the circumstances be delivered at the right price. So what is value? It depends on who you ask. So as far as different people from different perspectives, providers or clinicians may focus on issues like overuse. Whereas patients, they, val they may value more, perceive value more in solely how they experience the care that they receive. So there's a recent uh, value serve in healthcare survey performed by the University of, of Utah Health. That it's an online survey that surveyed over 5,000 patients close to 700 physicians and over 500 uh, employers. The respondents were asked to pick from a list of statements that may reflect value in the healthcare delivery. The statements were chosen to address those three uh, areas there of cost, quality, and service. The little graphic down there in the corner, this is the University of Utah's, uh, their value equation. Basically same quality of cost, but they also added the, the service component as well. So cost questions would be sort of like the patient's outcome, out-of-pocket cost is affordable, quality is the patient's help improve, or the service is that their experience was a, they had a friendly staff and helpful staff. 
So some of the most some of the results are not back yet, but these are the early re results that uh, that came back. And for the most part, in addition to ranking the individual statements, the survey also asked the, the respondents to explicitly list whether they value quality, service, or cost the most. So on the, the graph on the left shows that patients, the majority of them, 62%, uh, said quality was their, their most valuable aspect. Same was true for physicians, although much wider margin. <coughs> And as far as the cost and service concerned, it seemed like the patients were more concerned with the cost, whereas the uh, physicians were just slightly more concerned with the, with the patient experience, you know, how they, they felt that the, the patients were treated. So, so when the patients were asked to choose the top five statements that best reflect what they value most receiving in healthcare, there was no set value statements were consistently chosen amongst all of the statements. The top nine are, are represented here, but it also represents a, a, a mixture of both cost, I mean, service, and quality-oriented statements. There was, however, one top value statement, which was my out-of-pocket cost is, uh, is affordable. 45% of the patients selected that, and most notably that you can see that There's only 32% of the respondents chose my health improves. So as far as value is concerned as patients, they seem to want to uh, know that their out-of-pocket costs are lower. As far as physicians are concerned, there was a clear cut of these five statements that was the most pressing for, for physicians. So they clearly focus on quality and service-oriented uh, statements. And Analyzing the patient and physician value statements, strikingly 90% of patients had different combinations of value statements than any combination chosen by the physician. So if you take that information, you can see that when you see a patient in clinic, your physician's value has a certain set that they're, they're focusing on. Patients have a different set that focuses on. So you already set up slightly for failure because your options, don't, your values don't align. So makes it quite difficult already to, to uh, establish good value with their patient contact if uh, from the onset you already have different values to begin with. So now that we know the va know value means something to different people depending on their perspective, let's take a brief look back, a brief background. The U.S. spends disproportionately more money on health care when compared to other wealthy <laughs> countries. So according to the uh, CMMS, from projections from 2018 to 2027. In 2017, U.S. healthcare spending was approximately $3.6 trillion. And by 2027, national healthcare spending is projected to reach about $6 trillion. So here's the obligatory health expenditure per GDP graph. So as you can see, back in 2015, the U.S. actually spends close to 17, 18% of the GDP was spent on healthcare, whereas other comparable countries, they average somewhere between nine and 10%. So what do, we, what do we get for all of this money that we spent? As far as life expectancy is concerned, our life expectancy is much lower than all the other countries. Despite spending all this money more than any other, other country, the US outcomes are actually subpar as compared to other countries. So given all this data, what is the response? As far as the, the government and all is concerned, and governing in agencies, there's this value-based reimbursement. Why don't we tie payment, payment to performance on selected quality, cost, and efficiency measures? You heard of the MIPS system that's coming down the road? It's part of the MACRA, all these little acronyms. But it, according to this MIPS payment system, 5% of clinicians' revenue in 2020 is tied to their 2018 performance in quality cost improvement activities and promoting interoperability. And this increases to 9% in 2022 based on 2020 performance. So we, we're already in the midst, midst of this value-based uh, payment structure already. So essentially, you get dinged if you don't provide, pro 
prove that you're providing high value care. <coughs> so what a, this is just the, the cost of the health systems and clinicians. What about the cost of the patients? There's this New York Times article that said that getting sick can be really expensive, even for the in, insured. There's, a, there's data from the Economic Conference Hospital Missions. It shows that the line shows when a patient, someone gets admitted to the hospital. So before they get admitted to the hospital, their risk of going bankrupt is around, I guess, 3, 3.6%. But after the first hospitalization, see the, the, the chances of them going into bankruptcy skyrockets. So healthcare is expensive. So what's the solution? You want more value for your dollars. So when you go shopping for something, you want more value for what you pay for, right? So we don't want to waste our hard-earned money on, I guess, a crappy product. So what about healthcare waste? What is healthcare waste? It's anything we do in healthcare that does not make people healthier. So these are examples of uh, healthcare waste that was put in the, uh, the IOM report back in uh, 2013. It estimated about $750 billion in healthcare waste, according to that report. <coughs> so unnecessary services, excessive administration costs, inefficient delivery of care, inflated prices, fraud, misprevention and op opportunities, all of this contribute to the wasteful spending in, in healthcare. So let's take a little step back. Before we go more into waste, we need to understand some terminology. So cost is the amount of dollar, the dollar amount that it costs for a provider to deliver the health care service. So it's just like how much the hospital pays for a pack of red cells. A charge is the dollar amount the health care provider asks for a service. So the amount shown on the bill of an uninsured patient receives for a visit to an outpatient clinic. There's price, the dollar amount the patient pays out of pocket for the service. This is the portion the patient pays for a procedure at a local clinic, minus any kind of, well, this was after all of the discounts and whatever that insurance may pay for. And reimbursement is the dollar amount that the third party payer, insurance, negotiates as payment to the provider for direct and indirect costs. <coughs> this is what the insurance pays the hospital or the physician. So what is this charge master? Anyone heard of charge master? Okay. It's sort of like akin to uh, a menu at a restaurant, right? It's a list of charges of tens of thousands of billable items at a given hospital. It contains the itemized charge that goes on the patient's bill. And it's the amount of money that a self-pay patient is uh, asked to pay for a medical service. So this is, this charge master is usually used as a starting point for some closed door bargaining or negotiation with commercial insurers. So what usually happens is that the hospital negotiates with these insurance companies for, I guess, a discount for providing services to their, the people that they cover. But usually they, they negotiate a percentage of what's on the charge master. So as years go on, the way to get more inflated prices, they just inflate the prices on the charge master, thus they basically make a little bit more money on the insurance side. But the people that pay for us, the people who have no insurance, that they get the bill for this exorbitant amount of, of money for whatever, an aspirin costing about 18 bucks or so. So that's, that's how all of this began. So theoretically, this is meant to relate to both the actual hospital costs and the payments. So the CMMS compiles uh, information annually to determine the ratio of what a day in the hospital costs, so operating expenses, by what the hospital charges, called the ratio of costs to charges. So in this little graph, you can see that over the past 20 years, the average hospital ratio to cost of cost to uh, charge to cost has nearly doubled. Charges now marked up by up to more than 300% of their estimated costs. So you're thinking, well, nobody actually pays these charges, so what difference does it make? Uh, we've all heard the stories of someone being hospitalized and then the bill comes in and then you have the sticker shock as to how much care they receive and how much it costs. 
So even if patients rarely pay these charges, it perpetuates the opaque pricing that, 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 that we have in this area of increasing consumer-driven health plans and out-of-pocket costs for patients. So this shouldn't happen. We may be able to help deflate these bills simply by cutting out as much as a third of the line items through avoiding unnecessary care and overuse. So waste in healthcare. These are things that contribute to the waste in healthcare. So errors in preventable complications, care fragmentation, operational inefficiencies. We'll touch on a, a little bit of each of these topics. So the first report from that to air is human. We all heard about this. It's a 1999 Institute of Medicine report that revealed that as many as 98,000 Americans they die annually as a result of preventable medical errors. And it's an, the, the analogy that they used was that uh, every, a jumbo jet crashing every day. This, act, this report actually really got pe people thinking and acting to prevent errors and to prevent complications like CLAPSI or central line associated bloodstream infections or the CAUDI, catheter associated U UTI. So after some of the interventions were tried, a 2018, I mean 2010 study showed 1.5 million preventable adverse events occurred in hospitalized patients in 2008, which equated to about $19.8 billion in excess costs. It's still quite a problem. So next up is care fragmentation. So I'm a hospitalist, and a lot of patients get admitted, right? So it's common for patients to see multiple providers in the multiple specialties, often located in different practices and healthcare systems. And on average, a Medicare patient sees about seven different physicians. But you're in your hospital, you can maybe see by more than 15 clinicians during a single hospital stay. The typical PCP coordinates with an average of about 229 physicians across 117 different practices. So if there's an inadequate coordination of care, take your, the CHF patient is concerned, you admit the patient, you see the patient in the hospital, you discharge the patient on a new medication regimen, he goes home, gets confused about the medicines, he calls his PCP, and it turns out that his PCP didn't even know that he was hospitalized. So you see the disconnect there. So we need to do a little bit better at communicating these things with, uh, with our colleagues in the outpatient arena. How about operational inefficiencies? So inefficiencies in the hospitals is, has created a system where nurses spend less than a third of their working time performing direct patient care. A lot of times they do other, have other tasks that they have to do with charting. And, I mean, EMRs really hasn't helped this that much. And a 2013 study published in the Journal of Internal Medicine noted that intern physicians only spend about 12% of their workday directly with patients and more than 40% of the time with computers. So again, the EHR really doesn't help with uh, having direct patient care, being able to sit at the bedside and talking to the patients. And excessive administrative costs. In the U.S., physicians practice spend approximately $83,000 per physician per year for insurance company interactions. This is four times as much as Canadians. The why the discrepancy? I mean, it's at least partially due to the fact that the American health system needs to coordinate with multiple insurance providers on behalf of their patients. Most patients under the age of 65 obtain, have their health insurance with their employers, who in turn purchase their insurance plan from a private insurer so this means that more than one and a half million unique employers are purchasing insurance plans for more than 1,200 insurers in the U.S. The cost of dealing with this excessive insurance paperwork is substantial, and about 11% of the premiums are dedicated to administrative overhead alone. So there's a lot of waste there that could be put more towards actual patient care. What about pricing failures? According to a study in 2003, that compared uh, OECD, basically Organization of Economic Cooperation De Development Countries. There's 30 member nations there. So they did compare data with it, and it showed that on most measures, the health services in the U.S. was at least at or below that of the, the median, which means that if healthcare services utilization was about the same and the cost of 
and the cost is higher in the U.S., then that must mean that prices in the U.S. are much higher than it is in the other countries. So just for instance, an MRI in the U.S. may cost about a little over $1,000, whereas the same test would cost 200 300 in France. So there's clear evidence that uh, medical services in the U.S. are overpriced and seemingly immune to normal market uh, forces. In a properly functioning market, the price of service should be equal to what it costs to, uh, to produce, right? Plus maybe a little bit of a reasonable profit. But prices of many medical services in the United States just plainly exceed this standard. The other big thing is fraud. I mean, we all know about this. It happens, unfortunately. But billing for services that's not rendered, upcoding, doing coding for procedures, higher, I guess, reimbursable procedures than actually performed, providing explicitly unnecessary services. These are the low-value low care things that, uh, that we do, receiving kickbacks and uh, DME abuse, just, just ordering wheelchairs if they're not needed. And the other big thing is misprevention opportunities. So Americans receive only about half of the preventive, acute, and chronic care recommended, recommended by clinical guidelines. This may be due to the fact that primary care providers are faced with too many patients, lots of recommendations, and too little time. The old, the old uh, saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Inadequate disease prevention in the U.S. results in greater illness and uh, premature deaths. So in 2009, a study of family physicians showed that if you take the recommended guidelines, you would take them about 21.7 hours a day to, do, to spend the correct amount of time with the type of care that they give. So with acute care, it's about 3.7 hours, chronic care, about 10.6 hours, and the preventive care, 7.4 hours. That's the, just the recommended time. But on, the, on average, you only spend much less than that, because there's not much time in the day to do all of that. So what are drivers of overuse? I mean, the medical culture itself, I mean, in this training environment. So for most part, I mean, a lot of residents and all learn by seeing what other people do, right? So we have wide differential diagnosis. We want to order more tests to confirm or refute those diagnoses. And then there's the hidden curriculum where things that, just the way that you do things, gets the residents see that and absorb, see that and emulate that. So, and also omission, things that we just don't talk about may, may seem that may not be important. So one of those things is cost, right? I mean, not, not many of us speak about cost while we're doing rounds. Basically, focus more on the patient care and what to do for the patients. But, Hardly anyone ever mentioned, why should we do this test? Is it really going to change what we're going to do? And then next is the fee for, fee for service payment. We do more to get paid more. It's just the, the nature of the beast. Right? So for most part, how our payment system is currently means the more you do, the more you get paid. The less you do, the less you get paid. So it just incentivizes more volume. The fear of malpractice. So we all hate to get sued, or fear we don't want to get sued. So we want to make sure that we don't miss anything just so that we don't get sued. And the other thing is patient requests. So I mean, you, you have the, you think that patient wants all of this. You perceive that the patient requests this. But there are studies that show that if you just sit down and talk to them, the majority of them just want you to talk to them and uh, tell them what the risks and benefits are. And you can probably just bypass the additional testing. So the next objective is to identify obstacles. So there are many obstacles to high value care. I mean, misaligned financial incentives, time pressure. We'll touch a little bit on, on some of these. So clinicians and policy makers don't always see eye to eye. But there's one thing that nearly everyone can agree on. A major barrier to improving value is a healthcare system that's replete of with misaligned financial incentives. So the stakeholder each consider the cost of care in their own perspective. So the current payment system itself rewards condition, as I just said, for maximizing the number of patient encounters, but often does not reimburse for telephone follow-up 
or care coordination that improved the actual quality of care. So providers were, reduced, were reimbursed based on patient outcomes as opposed to the number of services that we deliver. You'll be have, we'll have stronger incentives to provide value-based care. So an example of this would be a patient with biopharyngitis is seen in the office because the telephone care is not reimbursed. But it's not only the clinicians. The vast majority of, of uh, hospital executives, including those at nonprofit hospitals, they're also compensated based on metrics related to productivity rather than patient outcomes and or community benefit. What about time pressures? Let's take this scenario. Let's just say you have an ER doctor with a busy waiting room and looking to empty the stretcher in front of him or her. Instead of just ordering one test and waiting on the results and then ordering another test, they just basically order more than one test at once just to expedite the workup, right? Well, again, I say I'm a hospitalist, and one of our goals is to decrease length of stay. But does actually decreasing the length of stay lead to overall cost savings, or does it merely shift the increased cost to the ambulatory setting? There was a, a study that was performed in 2011 that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine that may, see, that may have seen an association with this cost shifting. The proponents of this hospitalist, such as hospitalists, have some arguments and reasons for that, but I won't go into the, the, the main reasons for that. But the whole crux of the study was that they took a panel of patients from the hospitalist care for and the panel of patients of PCPs care for that still did the traditional medicine. And they found that, for the most part, the patients that were cared for by hospitalists had more readmissions, more ED visits, and um, less PCP follow-up. So one, I guess one argument against that is that what, the, what were the panel patients? I mean, in, as a hospitalist, you, you take all comers, right? So anybody that comes to the hospital that needs to be admitted, you go and ad admit the patient. So some of these patients, they didn't account for patients that did not have a primary care physician to begin with, or, and they didn't really specify how, if they had PCP follow-up on discharge. So that was the, the crux. So also, I mean, provider time may be better spent establishing and maintaining continuous healing relationships with patients rather than ordering tests and treatments that are unlikely to improve patient outcomes. So in fact, this time pressure approach of care may actually result in a creation of more unnecessary additional workload for checking results and informing patients of the results and then providing follow-up testing for any abnormal stuff. So doing all of these testing may, in fact, put more work on you because you just have to follow up on it. What about a knack, lack of knowledge and training? So historically, medical education itself system has not placed sufficient emphasis on training physicians to practice in a cost-conscious fashion or to be good stewards of healthcare care resources. One study showed that less than a fourth of physicians tested came within 25% of the actual charge for 15 commonly ordered tests. So for example, clinicians don't know where do not incorporate costs into decisions because they don't, were not taught where to find the cost. So now we do have something to, to look for. There's something called a healthcare blue book. You can go, with, go to that website and put in your zip code, and they'll give you some cost comparison that to, according to the zip code. How much does an MRI usually cost in that time? How much does CBC or BMP usually cost? So at least you have some idea of how much these tests actually cost. Let's take local culture and the hidden curriculum. I mentioned this briefly earlier, but the, the knowledge and training gap in high-value care strengthens the effect of local culture and the hidden curriculum on clinical decision-making. Hidden cur cur curriculum is uh, the informal mechanism by which trainees and all healthcare providers learn from their general clinical experience, peer interactions, and, and role models. In this environment, traditional beliefs such as more care is better care, or the best doctors have the longest differential diagnosis, are allowed to flourish unchallenged. Additionally, cultural values affect the choice of teaching topics in our training programs. And discussing real world issues like costs has historically been le considered less intellectual and less academic. So example of this, an attending physician commends the medical student for working up a rare but unlikely diagnosis on his or her patient. This perpetuates the 
the more workup. What about discomfort with risk and diagnostic uncertainty? So we as doctors, we want to be sure about everything. So both clinicians and patients, they want to they overvalue being certain and overestimate the ability of diagnostic tests to give us the answers that we want. In fact, clinicians may avoid considering options where information is missing or where probability is unknown. So again, ordering additional tests when the patient has straightforward clinical diagnosis, just to be sure. Fear of malpractice. This is the effect of defensive medicine on overall healthcare costs has been estimated to be about fifty-five and a half billion dollars annually, or two point four percent of the total healthcare spending in uh, two thousand and eight. So a study published in JAMA in two thousand and five stated that in Pennsylvania, ninety-three percent of physicians reported practicing defensive medicine, which resulted in the combination of overuse of unnecessary services like imaging and consultation and underuse of high-risk invasive procedures. So this highlights this, the, how pervasive the problem is in areas where high malpractice rates and the result twin problems of overuse and underuse of services. How about patient expectations? So both actual patient expectation and perceived patient expectations are drivers of unnecessary care. In a study done in 10 academic ERs, physicians were five times more likely to uh, prescribe antibiotics unnecessarily if they perceived that patients wanted them. But interestingly, these pa physicians were correct about their patients' desire only about a quarter of the time. So patient satisfaction has not actually been linked to whether or not the patient receives an antibiotic prescription at all, but rather it's tied to improved communication. So as an example, Again, desire to please the patient by ordering advanced imaging of low back pain because the patient requests the study. So what are steps that we can do to, what are the solutions to this uh, high value care? So medical education and value-based care, shared decision making, high value medication prescribing, and shifting in incentives. And this is by no means an all exhaustive list. I chose these just to talk about. So as far as medical education is concerned, Medicare invested about $9.8 billion in, uh, in GME in 2009, the single largest payer of G for GME, and, but it establishes very minimal accountability for, for achieving education and training goals. It's the MedPAC, the Med Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, which advises uh, Medicare on payment issues, has uh, identified cost consciousness as a critical deficiency in current residency training. So it recommended that Medicare leverage this to establish new performance measures that focus on the skills needed to provide our healthcare delivery system, to improve our healthcare delivery system. So the, in the MedPAC grant study in 2009, demonstrated only 23% of 26 internal medicine residency programs reported their res resident get training in cost-effective care. In a 2012 survey of, uh, from the Association of Program directors in uh, internal medicine, it, this continues to highlight the lack of formal curriculum in this area. It found that uh, only 15% of programs had curricula related to costs, although an additional 50% of programs were thinking about starting one. And while the majority of the programs, program directors thought that graduate medication was resp has responsibility to curtail the rising cost of care, just under half of them felt that their faculty working with residents model cost-conscious patient care. So we need to do better at trying to educate our residents and students about how to practice cost-conscious care. So how about medical schools were really no better. Data from the 2013 AMC graduation medical student questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that's given to all graduating medical students. And it showed that 63% of the graduating students feel the training they receive on healthcare economics was inadequate. Both the RAND and the Abdom uh, studies shows that a lack of qualified faculty to teach and role model cost care was cited as, as a major barrier to this. So the culture of medical training environment creates what educators often refer to as, again, the, the hidden curriculum. So what is this curriculum? Just formally define them as the formal curriculum is usually the actual planned lessons or written curricular objectives and the content that are delivered to medical trainees. So the hidden curriculum 
It's lessons that are taught informally, but are learned through the transmission of norms, values, and beliefs. Basically, we've been doing this all the time. This, this is perpetuated, right? Medical experts um, believe that the hidden curriculum is even more powerful than the formal curriculum for instilling values, beliefs, and behaviors. So consider how medical trainees are often rewarded for suggesting rare diagnosis in differentials for patients, and that many recent conferences just at traditional morning report emphasize in bizarre and very rare cases that require more intensive workup rather than focusing on the most likely diagnosis for the patient's uh, chief complaint. And then the null curriculum, which emphasizes that the topics or issues that are not taught are deemed to be not important, thus often sending an unintended message to trainees. Again, like, we, like I said earlier, mean we rarely talk about costs when we're doing rounds. So just by omission, we may see, oh, that cost is not important. Now, so there have been st some steps to uh, improve this teaching of value-based care. So the ACMG recently launched a new institutional approach to accreditation based on the CLEAR, so cl Clinical Learning Environment. We had one of those reviews just, just earlier this year or last year with the focus on integrating residents into the hospital quality and safety mission, including value. So the focus of this was this to extent which residents and fellows receive ex experiential learning in a quality improvement that includes consideration of underuse, overuse, and misuses in the diagnosis and treatment of patients. So the early, that's what the early experiences with, uh, with clear site visits had demonstrated. There's also this GME transformation fund where in the summer of 2014, these gaps in physician skills for delivering high value care prompted the Institute of Medicine to issue a report that proposed radical changes in the structure and financing of the graduate med medical education. This graduate GME transformation fund is, was made to su support efforts that help close the value-based care training gap. The ABIM uh, Foundation also has this Choosing Wisely initiative and the goal of that campaign is to promote conversations between clinicians and patients by helping patients choose care that is supported by evidence, that's not duplicative of other tests or procedures already received, free from harm or and truly necessary. And ACP also put out a, recently put out an ACP high value care curriculum as well to help to educate residents and students on this high value care. Next topic is uh, shared decision making. So Dartmouth professor Glenn Elwin and his colleagues nicely sum up the modern intention of uh, shared decision making. It's an approach where clinicians and patients share the best available ev evidence when faced with the task of making decisions and where patients are supported to consider options to achieve, achieve informed preferences. So you can, as far as shared decision making is concerned, you can use these tools like this decision aids, which is a way to communicate to the clinicians about their preferences for treatment options. It can, comes in many different formats. It can be paper, a web, or even video, just to teach patients how to, uh, or at least show them how to communicate better with, with their providers. Ever, anybody ever heard of e-patients? You know, the empowered patient is one of those tech-savvy patients people who are engaged in digital health. So those patients that look on the web, different resources, they read up on things, and then they, they come in and ask you questions about it. So the clinician reaction to these e-patients not been very universally welcome. I mean, ultimately, for e-patients to successfully advocate for their preferences, we have to be willing to listen and respond to this. We know all this information out there. I think it's part of our responsibility to kind of, yes, set them on the right track as to what is actually relevant to them and what is just maybe fluff. So there was a, a study a recent demonstrated there is, is a significant difference between merely telling patients information explicitly and actually explaining clinical reasoning. So many patients mis mistakenly believe that a PCI will prevent an MI. So researchers at the Cleveland Clinic and University of Michigan tested patient belief after receive first no information some explicit information or an explanatory information that uh, detail why PCI does not prevent MI. 
So perhaps, not surprisingly, patients who re receive explanatory information were significantly less likely to choose PCI and significantly more likely to, to instead choose a more optimal medical therapy instead for their care, as represented by that last graph. Okay, so defining value as a ratio of, of outcomes or quality over cost is just too simplistic. At the end of the day, care that improves some health outcomes while ignoring the patient's treatment goals or putting the patient through a miserable experience may not be worth it. And yet, meaningful, meaningfully involving patients in our decision is a goal that continues to frequently evade our profession. So patient experience, this term is is starting to crop up now. It's replacing the term of patient satisfaction. It's a core component of de delivering value-based care. Increasingly, patient experience is being viewed as the critical component of measuring and reporting quality of care. So Dr. Lee, a Harvard medical professor and the chief medical officer of Press Gagne, says that measurement of what matters to patient is here to stay. And the differences of, between uh, patient experience and patient satisfaction the idea is not to measure the amenities, like food and uh, parking. Instead, the intention is to track data, such as patients' confidence in their physician, their conditions, as measured by how would they recommend the hospital or the doctors to their friends and family. The perceptions of care coordination, whether they feel that their clinicians are listening to their concerns. So each caps. So. This hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems is basically a survey that's given to, I guess, random patients that when they get discharged as to see how their experience was. It's a 32-item survey and the data collection methodology. And the survey is typically, again, typically um, administered to random people. But it highlights what Dr. Lee said, how well doctors and nurses communicate with the patients, how well hospital staff help patients manage the pain and whether key information is provided at discharge. Since 2008, the results of the survey has been public reported, and 10 of the HCAP measures are formatted on the Medicare Hospital Compare website. So all of this information is becoming more and more readily available, and everyone's being judged by it. Hospitals are being judged by it. Clinicians are being judged by it. So it's imperative that we try to deliver more more value for what we do. How about prescribing medications? So high value medication prescribing. So basically providing the simplest medication regimen that m minimizes physical and financial risk to the patient while achieving the best outcome. So there's medication under use. So we all have the patients who, who are uncontrolled diabetics or uncontrolled hypertension. You give them medications and you cut come back for follow-up and their blood pressure or their sugars are still high. You ask them, so are you taking your medicines? Some people may not even tell you they're taking your medicines or not, but some of them you ask them, they say, no, it just costs too much, or I've been trying to make it stretch, make it last a little longer. Instead of taking it once a day, I mean twice a day, they're only taking it once a day. So when we do this, I mean, we should consider this as a possibility as to whenever a patient, quote unquote, fails to respond to pharmacotherapy. Instead of just adding more medications to it, we need to sit down and ask them what are the reasons why they're not taking their medicines. So how about complexity? These days with, uh, again, your CHF patient. They're on beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, statins. Medication complexity is, is a very High, highly modifiable risk factor to adherence. So therefore, efforts should be made to provide patients with the simplest appropriate regimen. The easiest for them to take it, the, the more adherence you'll have. And again, health literacy. As our patient population, I mean, health literacy is low in many populations, and a lot of patients have limited English proficiency. So I don't you guys ever read that Los Angeles Times op-ed about a Spanish-speaking patient was seen by her, his primary care physician, and physician prescribes a 30-day supply of some medication. The, the patient comes back three days later asking for a refill. He said, wait, can't figure out how, why the patient already ran out. So she said that she, she took the medication exactly it was written on the pill bottle, take once daily. But in Spanish, 
once is pronounced ante, which means 11. So she took 11 pills a day. So that just demonstrates that we need to make sure that we, our patients understand the directions that we give them. So shifting incentives. Perhaps the only health care policy on which Republicans and Democrats agree is the need to move from volume-based to value-based payments for health care providers. This was spoken by uh, Dr. Berenson and Dr. K from John Hopson in their uh, in 2013 in their report. We all know about fever service. What about pay for performance? This particular, uh, I guess, reimbursement model is built on a simple concept of providing clinicians or health systems more money for hitting specific targets, such as achieving certain percentage of diabetic patients in a practice that have good blood sugar control. Sounds good, right? You make your metrics, you get paid more. But the devil is in the details. So, I mean, there's lots of studies that have been done on, uh, on paper performance. And initially, the initial uh, implementation of it shows very good results. I mean, when, whenever you incentivize people to get better heart failure care or diabetic care and all, the initial thing is everyone's all in, they get the systems in place, and then the results are good as compared to people who don't get in, incentivized for it. But after a few years, Basically, the playing field gets level. Every, all, all of those improvements is completely gone. Either they don't keep it up, or all the people that was lagging behind finally catches up. So there's also the, the ACA that put in more some value-based purchasing and provision value-based purchasing modify. All these programs are intended to encourage physicians to work with their peers, their systems, and hospitals, and other professionals and their patients to hit quality targets while optimizing resource utilization. And the last thing is the cost sharing via the development of promotion of accountability ACOs and bundle payments. All of that is, is a way to shift the incentives. So vo vo volume to value, this is the transition. So we start from fever service and I guess the, the goal was to go to global payments where you get a set sum of money to provide all of the care for, for your panel of patients. No matter how much resource utilization the patients may have, you get a, a payment for all of that. So it's important to understand that the payment reform is not e an either or proposition, but instead a continuum of financial risk. There's a spectrum of options between <coughs> volume and value. So while details and effects surrounding financial incentives for motivating changes are controversial, it seems critical that we stop disincentivizing the delivery of appropriate care. In a transformed medical system, clinicians should no longer be financially punished for providing care that does not translate into a specific CPT code. Keeping patients healthy requires care that often centers on non-invasive therapies. If we are to expect clinicians to take time to appropriately counsel patients about risks and benefits of procedures or undertake true shared decision making related to complex medical choices or discuss the best and most cost-effective care, then we need, it's critical that there's some sort of compensation for this uh, cognitive task. So whether or not it makes sense to provide specific financial incentive for value-based care, the system needs to be calibrated so that the financial mechanics align with the intended goals and the outcomes. So clinicians are driven intrinsically by motivation and uh, by intrinsic motivation and professionalism, but we should no longer counteract that impulse with financial incentives that run explicitly counter to the, to the care that may be best for our patients. And those are my references. What questions do you have? Yes, sir. Your value-based equation I mean, most of the things you dealt with were related to the cost. Yes. Quality is a uh, soft marker, and it is really the value that, uh, that you meet or exceed your expectations of your customers. Yes, sir. Uh, was, I think we really need to talk more about the wow. quality part of this and how we achieve those uh, better patient experiences. 
Yes, sir. I mean, for the most part, I mean, we want better outcomes for our patients, right? That's the overall goal is to improve outcomes. So a lot of the quality uh, markers or the, I guess, the, the markers of quality itself is more process-oriented. There's not many uh, quality indicators that specifically deal with good outcomes or so. And there's really not, not good markers to kind of follow the whole spectrum of the disease. I mean, when someone comes in for, for we basically treat the, the disease specific thing, but, and then for that particular encounter, but we never track the whole spectrum of the disease. That, like in chronic care, like diabetes, for the most part. I mean, there's multiple facets to diabetic care. So for the most part, we don't, there's not a good system of tracking all of those outcomes. We only- I agree, I certainly agree with that. The issue that is, you brought it out, that the patients, more than anything else, it was what they were experiencing. Yes. It wasn't necessarily their outcomes. So well, as far as we're putting value on outcome, mm -hmm. and we should put value on outcome, yes. but we also need to be putting more and more experience or effort into the patient experience that they that's true. what they want. That's true. I mean, for the most part, that, that's, I agree that all of that should be part of the value uh, equation as well. Yes, sir. Dr. Nguyen, you've given us a great overview throughout the United States and the problems that we face. But all of these solutions are local. Yes, sir. And so there are always are things that we can think about. And I would challenge you to give us, as people learn from what you presented, one or two things that you think we can leave with today. Okay. And employ at our own institution yes, that would begin some of this change. I do, do have one for most part. If you round it with me before my team, for most part, I always ask our team, why do we have daily CBCs, CMPs, and, uh, and daily labs when all of, their, all of the patient's lab has been stable for the past day or two? Why do we keep on drawing lab on them? I mean, increases cost on blood draws, patient discomfort. They get woken up in the morning, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, getting stuck several times for blood draw that the doctors may not even look at or even act on. So one of the things that we can improve is basically less blood draws in the, in the hospital. So you're addressing variation in care. Yes. Uh, and so I guess the question would be, given the large number of individuals that approach that, uh, how could you begin to systematize and, and limit that variation in care? And what would you propose? I mean, for the most part, I would. What I normally tell my residents, basically, don't order daily labs. You see the patients every day. At the end of the day, you go through their chart, you see their labs and all, and you decide, do they need more labs the next morning? So just order one at a time rather than just a blanket order for daily labs. That will probably uh, decrease a lot, of the, a lot of the blood draws, but that's on a systemic system level. I mean, I guess you can Try to, I mean, I don't want to put it in Epic and say you can't order daily labs. That's be a drastic measure. But I don't know specifically of how to implement that on a system level at this point. At the VA, there's limits on how many days you can put lab draws on. It's a three day limit. Okay. So, I mean, if you can That's an option. Epic into limiting the amount of days you can draw the lab. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, my time is up. <laughs>